Welcome, everybody. I'm Ami Kassar. I'm the founder and CEO of Multifunding. We've been working with tens of thousands of business owners and entrepreneurs to help them figure out what, how to navigate the mess, not the mess, or the what's going on in the relief efforts and understand the PPP, the EIDL, the Main Street Lending Program. And the idea of this session, I'm so honored to have so many panelists join us today, is to bring together a diverse group of folks who have been on the front line of assisting the small businesses and entrepreneurs over the past few months. Almost in some respects, we are like the insurance, uh, the doctors or the nurses in the hospitals being told what to do by the insurance companies. And our job is to try and navigate it and bring it to life. What we hope to do through this session is by telling some stories of what we've learned over the last few months or perhaps learned during the last economic recovery and hopefully bring some insights or ideas as to what might happen next. What we're going to ask to do, we're honored to have John Ratliff this morning, who will be moderating our session. John is the CEO of Scaling Up. He runs a group of over 200 coaches around the world who have helped thousands of businesses to reimagine their, biz reimagine their businesses through the pandemic. What I'm going to like to do is I'm going to start with John and ask each person just to take a minute or two, and we'll go through it and introduce themselves and just share a story about what they've something they've seen or experienced on the front line during the last several months. And then once that's once we've gone through that loop, we'll hand the floor over to John and he'll get going. So John, why don't we start and just take a minute to introduce yourselves and 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 tell a little bit of a story or two about what you've experienced the last few months. Sure, thank you, Ami, I appreciate that. So yeah, I'm John Ratliff, I'm the CEO of the Scaling Up Coaches Organization. Uh, as Ami said, um, about 200 coaches around the world, five continents and 35 plus countries. And we're working with about 3000 middle market entrepreneurs on a methodology called Scaling Up, which is really a system and, and a set of tools and ideas around how to scale growth companies. Obviously, we've been very busy for the last nine months and helping our clients kind of navigate uh, what has become a, you know, a, a bit of a different landscape in business. So we've, we've seen lots of frontline stories, lots of successes, um, a, a relatively small number of, of failures, which is very encouraging. Uh, I think for us, Ami, the, the, if you want to talk about frustrations or, or things that um, I think you know, could have gone a little better during that period of time was, was really around the speed to get access to capital. I, I think, you know, so many companies were, especially in the beginning of, you know, March and April, um, there was so much uncertainty and, and we were all trying to make decisions around, you know, staffing and those types of things and, and getting access to capital quickly without a lot of, you know, hurdles to jump through for our clients globally as well. And I know we're, we're talking about you know, the US today, but um, was really probably the, the biggest hurdle and the biggest frustration. And unfortunately, a lot of that has continued, I think, through today. And I'm looking forward to a, a real healthy dialogue around, you know, a, a new set of ideas and a new set of, of strategies around how we can unlock some of that liquidity. So thank you for having me. I'm excited to moderate. John, thank you so much. Megan, who's next? Oh, that's me. I've introduced myself. Great. Who's next? <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Berg, Berg Advisors. Hi there. Thanks, Ami. Appreciate you having me here. Um, I'm Andrew Berg. I'm managing partner of Berg Advisors and Lightyear Advisors in the Philadelphia area. Um, I used to say that we were a very non-traditional CPA firm. Um, since the pandemic, actually, a lot more firms are starting to look more like me. Uh, we've been working virtually um, for almost 10 years in some capacity. So when this occurred, we were kind of ready to go. Um, it was unusual how it all occurred, but we've been uh, working virtual. So we're 100% virtual firm now. We provide business advisory services to a diverse client base. Um, our number one goal being part of their future, future success. Um, we are, uh, as I said, 100% virtual, providing typical CPA services. But really, we focus on the newer type services that most firms are moving into, such as coaching, technology, and innovation services. And as far as my experience, um, I think that a couple things come into mind. Uh, there was a huge community learning that happened very, very quickly within a one to two week period once they started to announce the different types of funding opportunities in late March, early 
April. So I saw a lot of people coming together and sharing knowledge to help people, which I thought was fantastic. But the process itself was very clunky. A lot of people who I dealt with and people who I knew worked with um, national banks. And unfortunately, they didn't have a relationship with those bankers. And it made it very, very difficult for them to apply. And then obviously, get the funding. And most people were frantic because they thought the money was going to run out. And then, of course, they revised that and brought it back again. But um, I think that the community learning was great. And I saw a, a lot of really fantastic people out there trying to help others. And, um, and then uh, from the banking perspective, you know, there was a lot of struggle on their side trying to get this stuff uh, passed through and uh, meeting people for the first time that were their clients that were working with them. So um, luckily for us, we have a niche in the e-commerce industry. So most of our clients have been pretty good, but I have seen a lot of service providers struggling with how, how to deal with the new world order of running a business during a pandemic. Thank you. Megan? Eric, welcome. Eric Weaver, founder of the Opportunity Fund. Thanks, Ami. Um, yeah, I'm founder and now senior advisor at Opportunity Fund. We are a Community Development Financial Institution, or CDFI, uh, a nonprofit micro lender. Uh, in our biggest year of lending, which was pre-pandemic, we made about 3,000 loans, over $100 million to mostly very small businesses in California and around the rest of the country now. Um, <clears throat> I guess, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell a couple, uh, I'll tell one story about a client that was, you know, was a client and a donor, it's actually our, our board chair. Um, when we have a client that is a maker of tamales, Alicia's Tamales Los Mayas, very successful business in the Bay Area. She had a location. She had, she started literally, uh, just, you know, selling tamales out of her station wagon. We lent her money to buy a van. We lent her money to you know, buy to get into a commercial kitchen and ultimately to uh, set up her own factory uh, in Hayward. And she's inside of Whole Foods. She's got a stall in the Chase Center, which is where the Warriors play. And uh, things were going swimmingly well. And then the pandemic hit and, you know, her business just plummeted. Um, our board chair is also on the board of a, um, a charter school in a city called East Palo Alto uh, in the Bay Area that's a pretty low income area. And um, the students at that school were all very dependent on getting uh, lunch every day for free from the school and the school had to shut down. So you've got a bunch of families who kind of depend on this one, you know, one big meal a day who are going hungry. You've got a, tamale, a maker of tamales and rice and beans and salad and whatever that uh, had all her business dry up and he funded her to provide meals. It's been going on since since March to provide meals every day for the kids from the school, um, you know, which he was able to do because he's very wealthy, um, but it's a lifesaver for Alicia and her business and for all the kids in the school. Um, I will, uh, I will, we, we definitely sprung into action with the PPP program. Um, we weren't able to be active in the first round because we did not have a, we don't use the SBA microloan programs uh, for a variety of reasons, but in, in the second round we were certified and, uh, provided just about a thousand uh, PPP loans with an average size of about fourteen thousand dollars, and I have more to say about that program if it's renewed. But I'll, I'll let's just move on to the next person. Thank you, Eric. Megan, who's next? Jason, welcome. Jason Temperman of Promontory Local Credit. Thanks, Ami. Uh, my, my name is Jason Tepperman. I. I uh, head up a firm called Promontory Local Credit. We are, uh, we are lenders to small businesses, uh, sometimes a little bit larger, uh, the small end of the lower middle market. Uh, and what we specialize in are situations where bank, uh, where business has a bank loan or is obtaining a bank loan and needs a little bit more capital than the bank is able to provide. Uh, typically because the business has strong, might have strong cash flows, but weaker collateral or other credit support. And in those instances, we'll provide anywhere from $500,000 up to, you know, three, four, five million to help fill that gap. Uh, so where, where we are a little bit different in the marketplace is the size loans we focus on. Uh, there are not too many folks out there 
uh, in this range. And then uh, second, the way we go to market is really together with a bank. Uh, so we'll, uh, you know, we, we try to create a very efficient process where we can use the bank's documentation, their packet, their reporting. So the borrower has, uh, the borrower has a much more seamless experience. Uh, our experience with COVID you know, was, was, uh, it was interesting. We, we lend to fairly high caliber credits. Uh, they're, they're, they're bankable businesses to begin with in most cases. And historically, we haven't lent into the sectors that were hardest hit by COVID. Um, you know, restaurants, tourism, travel, uh, uh, hospitality for, for, for other reasons. Uh, but that said, we haven't had any defaults or payments deferrals in this period. Uh, you know, to be sure, a number of our borrowers have seen declines in their financial performance, but these have been fairly manageable declines, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent, comparable to what one would find in a more typical recession. Uh, what we have seen at the same time is that uh, companies have had to make enormous changes in their operations uh, and the way that they approach their customers in order to, you know, in order to navigate through this period. So as an example, the lender... Uh, to a tutorial business uh, in the Southeast. Uh, they have two large segments uh, that they pursue. One is, um, uh, one are hospitals uh, and another are universities, uh, campuses. And, you know, obviously the university campuses closed fairly early on in this process and that resulted in a loss of business form. At the same time, businesses from, uh, you know, re requests and uh, 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 demand from hospitals picked up quite a bit. And so they had an enormous effort internally to reorient their business toward the healthcare segment uh, to be able to move people just because someone has transportation to a university campus doesn't mean they have transportation to a hospital. Uh, be able to obtain the PP uh, and be able to retrain folks to be able to serve the, you know, shift their business and serve the emerging need. So even if you looked at their financials, you probably wouldn't see much of a change. Uh, but if you looked at what they were doing day to day and the, the steps they were taking, you'd see an enormous amount of activity. Jason, do you mind just taking a minute and sharing with the audience your prior experience at the Department of the Treasury and the Small oh, Business Fund? Sure. Uh, so uh, pri prior to uh, uh, prior to starting uh, Promontory Local Credit in uh, in, in partnership with uh, uh, Promontory Interfinancial, I had uh, I had a a uh, career in government where uh, I, uh, prior career in government, I joined the U.S. Treasury in 2009 as part of the uh, as part of the team heading up the TARP program, uh, the uh, what's now remembered as the bank bailouts, uh, and then had subsequently led our small business lending fund, uh, which was a four billion dollar initiative, uh, partnering with community and regional banks around the country to increase small business uh, in commercial lending, uh, and in that program we worked with. 281 banks, uh, 51 community development loan funds, uh, and we're able to see a $19 billion increase uh, in small business loans, which was equivalent to about 77,000 loans in this, uh, you know, over the period. So uh, it, it, a, a policy that, that, uh, that that was highly applicable at the time, uh, you know, could, could work well uh, in this situation as well. And interestingly, uh, you know, ultimately earned a, ta uh, earned a profit for taxpayers. Uh, didn't, uh, didn't cost the taxpayer uh, anything to go implement. Thank you, Jason. Megan, who's next? Nimi, welcome. Nimi Natan, Gold Coast Bank and Trust. So, me, thanks everyone. <clears throat> uh, I am Nimi uh, Natan. I lead the small business lending group at a regional bank, Gulf Coast. Bank and Trust out of New Orleans. There are 40 of us. We're based in uh, Dallas. We manage the uh, direct lending into the SBA, USDA, and more recently, the MSLP program. Uh, we manage about $700, $750 million of, uh, of loans. Uh, we've had quite, quite a year as a direct SBA lender both our 7A business and obviously the PPP has uh, grown tremendously. And here we are a few months later and uh, our borrowers need more help. The economy needs more help and we'll talk about that. But I think as a whole, the PPP, especially the PPP has been very effective to our 
2,600 PPP borrowers, kept them in business, and um, was actually not a bad program. So excited about the next phase, and I know that's coming, and I know we'll talk about the shortcomings of the old programs and what can be done for the next ones. Thank you, Nimi. Thanks, Ami. Thanks. Renee Johnson, Public Private Strategies, welcome. Hi, and thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Renee Johnson, I'm a senior advisor here at Public Private Strategies, and we have an advocacy arm called Small Business for America's Future, uh, which is a national coalition of business owners and leaders working to provide small businesses a voice at every level of government. Uh, we're committed to ensuring policymakers prioritize Main Street and advancing a just, equitable economic framework that works for small business owners, their employees, and their communities that they live in. Uh, we actually executed a, a survey from October 2nd through uh, the 5th, where it was an online survey. We had over 1,500 uh, small business owners from across the country completed. Um, and we're talking more about after the PPP second round, uh, after EIDL, and we knew the issues that were there. And we're looking at now we're six months after, you know, there was actually a bill that provided relief. I wanted to know where small business owners were at that point in time. Um, and they said that the pandemic continues to hit small business owners hard. 15% uh, of them said that their business can only survive through October. Uh, so they, they technically expect it to have closed now that it's December um, if they didn't get any federal funding. 34% uh, of those small business owners said that they can only make it to the end of 2020. Um, when we asked them about congressional priorities, 87% uh, of those small business owners identify something other than the Supreme Court nomination, uh, because again, in that point in time, that was during uh, October. Um, and now I know we're in December and a lot has happened, but uh, many small business owners are still in need of some sort of relief. Uh, they need Congress to do something. 52% uh, say that Congress should pass a new economic relief package. Um, and I'm pretty sure that number has increased now by the day. Uh, and also 27% of uh, said that Congress should focus on election security. So now that we're post election, we actually conducted another survey um, and wanted to know more about where our small business owners were. Um, many, many, many of our small business owners believe that unfortunately the GSA should have acted um, in a swifter manner because they believe in a peaceful transition of power was necessary to uh, afford them the opportunity for some sort of economic relief. And we also know that many of these small business owners know that they are uh, unfortunately going to close by the end of this year with no idea of how to come back or they're going to file for bankruptcy. So. We, we definitely will probably get into more of that about how these small business owners feel. Um, and I, again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. Thanks, thanks for being with us. And last but not least, Mr. Steve Sefton. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this, Ami. Um, Endeavor Bank is a boutique, I would describe it as a boutique bank. We focus on uh, small, uh, medium-sized business owners from my uh, uh, view. 5 million in sales up to 100 million in sales. So the very small business owners that were so negatively impacted by this um, crisis in 2020 are really um, not our client base, nor our hospitality, retail or restaurants. So like one of the other panel members, I think it was Andrew, we, we avoided a lot of the um, industries that were so negatively impacted by the COVID crisis. And I would say most of our clients are doing very, very well. So therefore our bank is doing well through this crisis. Um, we're old fashioned in that um, in the olden days, decades past business, the business owners, owner managed companies, which is our focus, would meet with their banker on a regular basis. And the banker was almost a, 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 an independent advisor to the bank as if it was their advisory board. And that's the, the role that we play with our clients. Um, that played very well in this whole PPP uh, period because the big institutional banks, as someone on the panel has already said, didn't have that uh, close relationship with their clients. And that was vital for clients to get to the PPP money. So they, the big institutional clients came flocking to the community banking world, not just us, but the data is out there that the community banks outperformed the big banks uh, because of that relationship. 
and it it really played well in being able my partner and I were the ones pushing the buttons for approving the loan so clients had direct relationship with that we more than tripled the size of our bank uh, Ed Carpenter my indus, one of my industry's biggest consultants said we we're we proportionally we were in the top five in the country in terms of how many loans we did did over 840 loans for a bank that was only three years old and only had 120 million in loan totals at the time that uh, PPP started. So we really um, outpunched our weight. Um, and and it, it almost killed us physically. It was an enormous load to carry. But the, the antidote that um, I think of, I mean, you asked for antidotes during the period, is the Tuesday before the Friday um, when the first rollout happened. And when they announced that the rate on the note was going to be 1%. And we realized before that they were talking about 4% and a 4% short term 100% guaranteed note would have no problem uh, finding liquidity in the market and the free market uh, institutions buying that paper up and providing liquidity. And when we realized there wasn't going to be no liquidity for that paper at 1%, we realized that it was going to be funded off our balance sheet. And I, I don't have... Um, evidence for this opinion, but I think that's a big part of what froze a lot of the big banks, uh, along with a lot of other reasons. Uh, the funding source, there was not a, enough balance sheet capacity to, to, to fund all of these loans. Uh, and we were really struggling with that. Um, we went ahead and, and, and did some fancy footwork and dancing and moved forward and it, and it really played to our benefit. Um, the markets ultimately opened up in the second round uh, but for that first round, we were <clears throat> we were playing it on the edge uh, and, and trying to figure out how we were going to fund all these loans. So that was the biggest that was the biggest uh, issue for me at the time. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone uh, making the introductions. And Megan, maybe we want to go back to the front slide. And Mr. John Ratliff, scaling up, we're going to uh, hand the floor over to you and your capable hands to try navigate us to come up with some good ideas here. Yeah, so that's a that's a great jumping off point. I mean, our goal today is to create some some action items and some ideas that um, that we can take back, and also just to have an, an open dialogue about the state of affairs. And Steve, I think that was a great segue. I I and I want to kind of put some definitions out today. You're going to hear us talk about small and medium sized businesses. You may hear the words middle market and kind of for the sake of today's discussion, I, I think we should define small and medium business in the middle market as, you know, a million in revenue on the on the front end to about a billion in revenue on the back end. There's lots of different definitions for the middle market and SMBs and depending on who you talk to, there's different ranges. But for today, let's talk in that range. And historically, that middle market creates 70% plus of the job growth uh, in the US. And so I thought we would start with the panel of just the kind of state of the union, the overall state of, of liquidity and balance sheet risk for that, you know, for that what we'll call middle market group of companies. If we could, if we could just have people reflect on where they think the, the liquidity and balance sheet risk lies for that group of companies today. Nimi, any thoughts on that? Um. I'm sorry, uh, John, could you please repeat the question? Sorry about that. Taking a sip. Yeah, that's, a, that's okay. I, we, I wanted to start with the state of liquidity and, and balance sheet risk for the middle market. So defining the middle market as a million to about a billion in revenue. Um, what are the, you know, what are the risks, balance sheet risks and liquidity risks today? Yeah, so um, the, uh, it, it, as people already pointed out on, on the call earlier, it's the market is uh, very diverse. So if you're in e-commerce versus if you are a uh, office a mall operator, a restaurant, a hotel, they all have completely different business models and balance sheets and income statements. So the need will really depend on what has happened uh, temporarily uh, during the crisis, but really the change in the in the business model is a result of the moving away from the cities, moving to remote, uh, not traveling as much, buy, 
eating out versus uh, eating in delivery. So I would say it would it would uh, vary to companies that suffered significantly but are coming back. It's um, managing the uh, operating losses and working capital that they went through in the last few months and then gearing up. So again, working capital, um, there will be a, an important um, use of capital. The second one would be debt refinance. So uh, a lot of those companies have debt outstanding, whether it's uh, bank debt or SBA debt, whatever it is. So stepping back into the debt markets and, and cleaning up the balance sheet is also a significant need. That's great, thank you. Any other panelists want to reflect on that? The current state of liquidity and, and risk? Yeah, I think, I think maybe it's just fair to say that um, the, the world is kind of bifurcated into two groups of companies today. Uh, you've got companies that have hung in there or stayed flat um, or actually done very well in COVID. And they present one set of issues and opportunities because a lot of those companies are where the growth, the job growth will come from. And then on the other side of the coin, you have companies that continue to be decimated, such as hotels because of COVID. And so I think from a policy and an implementation process, uh, there's two challenges, how to help the people who are um, on the struggling to survive who might not come back for a long time or might not be salvageable. And then how to, oh, that's the one side of the coin and that might be PPP relief or other help. And then how to ensure that the companies that are growing or stable um, have the liquidity and have the incentives to hire and have the tools to grow and expand. I mean, I would jump in and just say, I would say there's actually a third group, believe it or not. And I think those are the people who change their business model and realize they actually like the new business model better than the model they were already in and are now trying to determine what their future looks like in this new business model. So many people I speak to, and I, I speak to my clients on a regular basis about this, just to psychologically find out how things are going. And so many people, as somebody, another panelist said, have fled the cities and gone on to you know, be 100% virtual and realize that they don't need to operate their businesses with such significant uh, numbers of people and now are scaling themselves down and becoming bigger and better. We have clients in the hospitality industry that if you had asked me what was gonna happen to them in May, I would have been extremely worried. And today he tells me he's completely changed his business model, is a much happier person than he has ever been and is ready for whatever the future brings. So I think you're right, definitely two for sure. And I think there's possibly a third group of people out there. So um, I'm actually looking forward to what 2021 brings because I think all of us have learned how to live in this new world order. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Steve, did you wanna make a point? Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, it's repeating a point that I made in my opening comments and that others have made. It's, it's really targeted in those areas that we've already discussed, retail and restaurants and hospitality. And I've been am amazed at what our clients have done to get through this and how well they're doing. We had some really dire predictions in June in our boardroom. Um, uh, most of our board members are independent business owners and the rest, one of them started a, a pretty well-known local restaurant chain. And another one um, has uh, raises real estate investment funds. He was predicting you know, 60% vacancy. And of course the restaurant chains, their predictions rain true they've been shut down um but the real estate uh vacancy rate never went below four percent for him uh for the fund uh, and he's done quite well um and most of our clients have done well and i've just been in, in you know office chair supply uh chain who would think that that would do well in, in this economy uh, as people geared up their home office um they, his sales are through the roof. I would have never predicted that. I would have predicted his business would be crushed by the office environment going down, but his sales are skyrocketing. So the, the kinds of businesses that did well and are continuing to do well, and in that space of five to five million in sales to hundred million in sales where we reside that are not in those targeted problem areas, 
the economy is doing quite well for our clients. And so their liquidity and balance sheet uh, risk to go back to the original question is doing quite well. So um, that begets the question or the comment then um, that this panel is all about. So what should we do then in the future with future tar uh, PPP or programs, fiscal stimulus programs? Uh, they need to be targeted in my opinion, targeted on those areas that are really struggling and suffering and, and, and where people are out of work, where people are really hurting. And there's a lot of people out there in this. And I just looked at the California unemployment rate down to, it's now down to 9%, San Diego 7.7%. I predicted back in June that we would be to 8% by the end of the year because I, I at that time was seeing it much more positive than what people were saying. I thought the negative was way overdone um, and it's, it is coming back, but that's, you know, the old adage that it's a recession when the other guy's out of work, but when you're out of work, it's a depression. That's nine, that 9% 9 number in California is still a lot of people. And, and so this, this new stimulus needs to be targeted. Can I just jump in and say that, that I couldn't agree more. Um, we don't serve the, the markets you guys are talking about where people are, doing surprisingly well. We serve businesses of a million and under in revenue. Um, and we're, there are a lot of folks that are still struggling mightily. I mean, all, we lend to a lot of restaurants. We lend to, uh, you know, all kinds of service businesses, retail. The trucking industry where we do a lot of lending has actually bounced back pretty well. And we're, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, volume there. But um, the really small businesses, the businesses, in communities of color, especially, um, you know, are are not doing as well. Um, there are higher, you know, people. There are more people sick. Uh, there are people that don't have jobs and can't patronize those businesses. You know, we serve a lot of hair salons. Guess what? They're not doing well. Um, so it needs to be very targeted. And I'll just say now, when it, this is my people that know me have heard me talk about this a lot. The the single biggest problem I have with the PPP program, and I agree it was it was a success in some ways, although we should talk about that more, but um, is it was ludicrous that it, if you were a lender doing PPP loans, no matter how small the loan, the maximum fee you could charge, you got paid was 5%. Think about that. How are you gonna, we made a $4,000, we made several $4,000 PPP loans. We lost a lot of money on those. I mean, we're a nonprofit. We, we do lose money on some loans, but you know that should have been thought through. What? Who, who couldn't figure that out? That there needs to be like a minimum. You know, banks got rich on this program, and we lost a lot of money on it. Getting loans to a thousand people, you know, they need, if they do that again, they've got to figure out a way to make it at least a break even to make a very small loan. Well, and I wanted to chime in on that point, uh, Eric. You made. Um, many, many, many small business owners of color, which especially in the black community, 94% uh, of them are sole proprietors. Uh, they are independent consultants and they do not have relationships with banks. So the PPP being part of the 7A loan program in the first place should have been a conversation that we did not do. We should not have executed through the 7A loan program because we already barred out so many underserved communities that already exist. So now we need to talk about with recovery, how do we get those small business owners back? How do we help them and ensure not only those 5 million and above small business owners are successful, but we're making sure the 1 million and below are successful as well because they're part of the community, they're main street, and they're making sure that the services or subcontractors or subprime lenders are, 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 are connected to them as well. So there's so many domino effects that are impacted when we're not talking and are not specifying communities of color and being inclusive as well. It's also a lot of jobs. I mean, it's a surprising number of jobs that are provided by those size businesses. So it's a great, it's actually a great segue into to where I thought we would go next. So the first round of PPP, 5.2 million loans were made, 525 billion in total proceeds, about a hundred thousand dollar average per PPP loan. And as most of us remember, by the way, I'm a I'm a 50% shareholder in a restaurant, and our targeted opening date was March 17th. So I totally get the I totally get that side of the equation as well. We opened for takeout in, in the middle of April and it's been a bloodbath for us since. So I, I totally see that side completely. 
Um, and in the beginning, PPP to, I think, I forget which panelists made the point, but it was a little bit like the Wild West. There were rumors the money was going to dry up. It was almost like a gold rush. And then the 4% interest, 1% interest. Totally agree, Eric, that, that you know, some banks did really well, but it was totally skewed. But I think, you know, in many ways, it served some purposes and helped kind of get us some liquidity. Now we've had time to reflect on it and, and time to really look back and see how the program played out. And as we do the next round of, of PPP, two questions. One, what mechanisms can we put in place and how do we think about where that funding should go in a much more targeted way? And Renee, I definitely wanna hear from you on that point, certainly. <coughs> And more importantly, what's the goal or what's the role of this next round of PPP? There, there's really emergency funding and there's growth funding and what role should PPP play in growth versus um, sustainability or emergency funding? So that's our next, that's our next question. Uh, just to answer that latter portion, we definitely need to make sure that there's one grants, not loans. Uh, incorporated in this relief program. Um, yes, PPP builds a support for people, but there's a lot of people it leaves out. And then also, if we're going to put additional funding in, we need to have some technical assistance funding to ensure communities that are hardest hit uh, have the ability and accessibility to connect with those resources to ensure that they're part of the loan program. One, one question that might uh, narrow it, 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 and it's maybe there's some ideas that could be generated from the diverse perspectives on this panel. Uh, last round of PPP, pretty much anybody could get it. Um, there wasn't um, a criteria, but now we're nine months, eight months into the pandemic. And I, I think it's safe to say if uh, if somebody's business is, is hung in there, they probably don't need another PPP loan. So, whether it's PPP or maybe through the EIDL program, do we have any ideas or recommendations from us in the, on the front end or the street implementing this stuff as to how we could sort out, identify and administer uh, those who need it and can get it to them quickly without making it too complicated? So Nimi, you're gonna have your back and suddenly you're gonna say only certain types of people or companies are now eligible for the next round of PPP. How's that gonna work? Yeah, I, uh, so we, we for our bread and butter has been 7A for many, many years. And I know there's criticism of the program, but it's a great program because it still leaves the accountability with the originating bank. One of the things that we saw in PPP is what we saw in every mortgage crisis in history, the disintermediation. So people, a lot of the originators just couldn't care less about what they were putting out, which uh, led to fraud, to waste, and all the politicized things that we're hearing now. So I think beefing up a PPP-like program with some of the uh, procedures of 7A would, would make uh, for a very good product. Uh, and I can I can spend hours talking about it, but I do want to talk about two quickly talk about two other things that need to happen prior to a launch of a new program. One, and Steve mentioned that is um, you got to give liquidity to the banks. So this is not the government's money. This is banks' balance sheets, and small banks like us, under ten billion dollars in in uh, in assets, we have finite amount of capital that we can put against programs like that. And the liquidity, there is no liquidity. There is no secondary market for this kind of paper. So before we launch into another, whatever it is, 300, 600, 900 billion dollars, and assume that the smaller banks, the community banks, the regional banks are gonna uh, continue supporting those programs, we need to free up capital to be able to do that. So whether it's through forgiveness, through participation, through just, just take it away from us. We need to worry about uh, banks' liquidity too. That's one. Two, um, the uh, um, I'm sorry. I'll keep it at that. So uh, the uh, 
many ways to improve on the PPP, on the traditional PPP. And I think we can look to the 7A as uh, for some of the guidelines and some of the procedures, uh, keep away people who are not qualified to lend, which we saw during the, the PPP. Uh, with all due respect to FinTech, uh, they're really not geared towards the uh, uh, kind of application that we've seen anyway. And then second, make sure that the distribution is healthy, meaning the banks have the liquidity and the capital to be able to do that. Uh, I'd like to jump in real quickly. I wanted to mention, Renee, you had said something I thought was great earlier about the this really small businesses and sole proprietors. We can't forget about the fact that they also maximized how much money a sole proprietor could actually get in the PPP loan. So these businesses that were wearing multiple hats or were relying on a certain amount of revenue to pay themselves were maximized at a certain amount of money. And we're now eight months in and they were basically maxed at $20,000 if... Um, and, so that, in addition, was, I think, really difficult. I think when I think about it and break it down really at the lowest level and think about, uh, it's easy for me to help clients who have access to me and I know what I'm doing. And I think about clients who don't have access to professionals. And in our, in our DIY nature of how everything works today, I'll do my own tax return. I'll do my own payroll. I'll bank with you know one of the big banks out there and not have a relationship. I think a lot of people got caught when we got to April realizing that they weren't going to be able to easily get one of these loans unless they understood what they were doing or they had access to somebody like me. And even in those scenarios, when you have tax returns that are incomplete or look inaccurate or payroll tax forms that look inaccurate, people like myself weren't going to try and help support those people because of the danger and the liability associated with that type of information. I think that there's got to be a lot of education poured into this in the beginning to help people at a much lower level who don't have access to these types of resources to understand how do they get to the point to take their time, allocate it properly in order to go get one of these loans. They're already running around with multiple hats on just trying to survive in their business. So the application process, in my opinion, has to be so much easier. And I think in particular, the, the, the double verification process, I think was really, really complicated. To ask people to verify in the beginning in order to get the loan and then tell them they're going to verify at the end for forgiveness is complicated for people who are doing running around wearing multiple hats in their business. And um, those are the ones who I saw fail the most and have the most struggle with this PPP. They were the ones who were calling me on that Thursday before funding saying, I don't have a relationship with my banker. My tax return's not completed. I need one of these loans. What am I going to do? And I basically threw my hands up in the air. There's almost nothing I can do if certain people don't follow a certain structure. And there's not enough education, I think, in the business community to make sure people know what does or doesn't need to be done in order for them to be able to apply and get these things easily. So one question is what, what could happen now? So we, we, we've identified the problems and the, the issues, but um, one concrete recommendation is for the Federal Reserve to be working with the community banks to make sure that there's enough liquidity so that when the next round of PPP comes in, they can handle it. But if there were specific ideas or recommendations as to how we can actually, because it's going to be targeted, but how that could work, how, how that targeting could um, uh, be implemented in the street. It's going to be us who are going to have to do it. So how do you know if it's, you know, how does somebody prove that they've been hurt and that they're entitled to a grant or aid in a Steve, way that's simple ahead. and scalable? Well, they already Steve. did it in the original PPP rounds. If you recall, and I think it was the second round, my memory is hazy from those days because it was, huh. it, it gave me brain damage, but um, <laughs> We had a period where the smaller banks had access to the program before the big banks. Um, I, so they've already did a minor bit of targeting. So I would, tar I would create a target for small business, minority owned business, um, a preference, I should say, small business. Uh, and further, let me say that we've, we've learned so many lessons. I think there were, my chief credit officer told me there were 35 uh, facts that were sent out FAQs. Uh, I felt like more than that, felt like one every day. 
Um, so we, this may not, this may be a PPP may be an imperfect uh, vehicle to push the money out, but we've already learned a lot of lessons and we've already um, got a process. I would say, let's not reinvent it. Let's use the vehicle that's already there. Um, even though I, I really prefer not to go through what I went through before. Um, but I think it will go much smoother this time. And we've, we've fixed a lot of the problems, but let's target it. Let's target it to minority owned business. Let's target it to businesses under a million in sales or under 5 million in sales. Let's target it to restaurants, target it to hospital, hospitality, create the most negatively impacted list of businesses and redo PPP targeted at them. There'll be much smaller loans. Um, if we need to fix the reimbursement to a fixed rate of a, 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 a set fee uh, out of the loan proceeds to make it desirable, we can do that. But I think targeting is the best approach and use the vehicle that we've already got experience with. And the, the, to answer the question about what about the businesses that don't have the relationship with the, the local banks, I think that's the biggest question that we have to overcome if we're going to do this. What if we said, so the certification last time was that something to the effect of you are concerned that due to COVID-19, your business is going to be hurt. That was a certification and that opened up a broad breadth for a lot of people into the program. What if the certification now from the bar's perspective is you certify that your revenue are making up, making up in the last six months compared to the same time last year is down 50% or 20% or 30%, then you're eligible for. I think that's just uh, yeah. arbitrary. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Abby, I, I think the- yeah. some We need some criteria that makes it, because I don't think we're gonna open up. I mean, I'm not sure that- uh, Hello? I mean, can, can uh, I mean, can you hear? I think he's frozen. Okay, let me, let me, I'll say something. Uh, I'm not sure that the, if we err on overfunding this program and giving it to deserving, but maybe not as deserving bars. So let's, let's leave out fraudulent requests. Uh, I'm not sure that's the worst thing in the world. I think putting more liquidity into the system, more working capital into the system you know, we could we could uh, make worse mistakes than that, as opposed to making it complicated, making it difficult to get, discouraging people from applying because they don't want to go through uh, the brain damage Steve already suffered uh, dealing with it. So, again, overwhelming the system with with uh, with uh, capital right now is not the worst thing. I think we. We can do a better job as a banking community, as a regular. We can do a better job protecting against fraud, which is, which, uh, which is a no-no. But as far as giving it to more people, well, and uh, worse things in the world. I'm going to kind of disagree. I mean, I, I generally agree with that, but I do believe strongly that it needs to be that a good portion of it needs to be targeted to people that have genuinely suffered. Is there a way to to actually use tax returns for this. I mean, we're, we're getting to the end of the year and um, you know, if somebody files a tax return, it'd be a great incentive to file your return quickly. Um, you know, when your, your revenues are down 30% from last year, guess what? You're, that's probably due to COVID. You know, and, um, and maybe give you know, grants to some of the smallest businesses, not even have it be a, a PPP loan, uh, but then you know, others that, could you know can, could could get the PVP loan? Uh, I I think there the tax return seems like the easiest way to to verify what's going on with their their revenue. Uh, I, mean, I, 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 I oh, go ahead. No, please, Jason, go ahead. I I, I would chime in. I, I think the the current proposal in the in the in the new stimulus discussions is that a business demonstrate that its revenue is down thirty five percent, which is significant for for a business. I think. Um, I think the second way to look at it might be, uh, you know, might be a retrospective view. So if you had, as an example, 
uh, you know, a blanket certification like the like the one in the first round, but you condition forgiveness on demonstrating a 35% reduction in revenue. That might simplify matters quite a bit. People would have additional liquidity through this period if they were concerned about the ongoing economy. And then, you know, as, as Eric says, when tax returns are done and and uh, you know, folks see where they are, say in, in March or April, uh, you know, it will be clear whether or not that money was needed for their operation and the government can scale forgiveness proportionately. I am a little concerned, uh, you know, just to uh, Eric, I, I tend to agree with you on this, about simply putting more capital out, uh, you know, as a, as a cushion that's not necessarily needed. Uh, PPP, the record on PPP is a bit mixed at this point. It's a very popular program among business owners and among politicians. The academic research that's coming out on it is, is starting to tell a different story. Uh, Raj Shetty and his team at Harvard uh, have done some very detailed work around this, and they estimated that the program costs $377,000 per job saved. Uh, and that is a really interesting number because the average annual income uh, for a worker in a small business is $45,000. And it starts to invite some really difficult questions around where $500 billion actually went. Uh, there were some articles in the New York Times and the Journal today about the fact that the top 1% of businesses got you know, a, a very large portion of this capital. And you know, I, I think it'll be, it'll be important both for the uh, integrity of this program, but also support for small business more broadly to be able to demonstrate that the, that the taxpayers' funds are being used uh, in a productive way. Uh, I would just jump in and reference the tax return issue. Um, <clears throat> so there's a large issue going on right now around taxability of, that, of the PPP funds or the non-deductibility of the expenditures. So we are holding off on any decision to file tax returns at this point because I have seen in my history legislation go as far as may retroactive to prior in the year or to a prior, previous year. And I don't want to be in a situation where we file tax returns and people pay tax on something that may be overturned. So why that's still up in the air, I'm not sure. It's a major issue. And it's one of my big concerns here in any new legislation is that the taxability issue gets solved and decided ahead of time. Because there's a lot of people that have mistrust in this program now because suddenly 25% of what they took, they need to come up with the cash for to pay tax on whereas we were encouraged to pay 100% of it on keeping people employed. And I think that that's gonna cause a lot of accountants to hold off on tax returns and maybe go extension. So even though I think it's a great idea to use that as an example, I think that there's gonna be some timing issues and that money needs to be infused sooner than March or April. Andrew, I, I might push back on that. Just I, I appreciate the issue uh, and, and the fact that it remains open notwithstanding the IRS's guidance. But my understanding is that this issue applies mostly to people who were profitable uh, over this year, that you're not going to pay taxes if you weren't generating a profit. And I, I think there's a real question as to, you know, should a new round of PPP go to, you know, go to entities that were substantially, you know, earn substantial profits in this year? Mm -hmm. Is that really where the money should be targeted? Uh, I don't think that's entirely true. So it, again, profit, you, the definition of profit could be discussed over and over, but the the expenditures used for PPP loan, irregardless of what your business was or wasn't profitable, does get added back into income at the end of the mm -hmm. year. And yes, if you were a profitable business, you're now a more profitable business yes. for sure. But in certain cases, if you were a loss business, you're still going to be either a smaller loss or maybe a profitable business. So there's businesses out there that I'm aware of. I, um, I have a client that's lost several hundred thousand dollars, but when you add the PPP back in, they're going to look, they're going to have a, be a profitable business with the PPP loan back in money was spent hundred percent on staff, keeping them employed and keeping and staying in business. And they don't have the revenue. I'm sorry, the uh, cash flow to pay the 25% tax on the PPP funds that they received. So they're going to show a profit on their personal, on their business tax returns, despite the fact in reality, it was a, um, a negative, a loss year. I think this goes to the point again, um, difference of opinions and reading of the legislation and also the rules 
uh, are very difficult, right? And I think going forward, we need to have clear cut rules, guidelines, guidance needs to be provided on the onset. And also in crafting the legislation, we need to have the agency that's implementing a part of that. Because we are seeing right now the SBA and Department of Treasury were not involved in any of those conversations to draft the language. And we had staffers and as a former staffer of Congress, I don't know certain things that happen within the agency and the agency's uh, processes. So if I'm crafting legislation that has to be implemented, the rulemaking process takes a lot longer. And unfortunately, we have to speed through that process. So we need to make sure that those agencies are a part of those conversations as well. Uh, and then more specifically, yet again, I want to reemphasize the fact of technical assistance. If we're able to do technical assistance and provide that to not only the providers of the loan, but also to those who would like to have loans, we wouldn't be in the situation as well. And then my last point on that is, we do know that within communities of color, there are disparities within the banking system. And also there is a huge distrust among bl older black uh, populations with banks. We need to resolve that. We need to have more banks reaching out to those communities and bringing them in as, as a part of the fold so that they can bring their business to those banks. And that's a nice segue, Renee. Thank you for the next um, topic for discussion. So. You know, obviously, speed of implementation was was an issue early on with PPP, large banks versus small banks, and and there was a lot of uncertainty. There's, you know, as with what Andrew just said, there's still uncertainty nine months later, and and I think someone mentioned the 35 FAQs that came out, and and we're going to talk a little bit about Main Street lending in a little bit, but. There's been an incredible amount of uncertainty for banks. Banks, lenders specifically, have been kind of caught in the middle and the goalposts have been moved many, many times. And you couple that with the bank's uncertainty around the risk profiles, their balance sheets. How do we, how do we make it easier? How do we free up from a regulatory standpoint? Obviously, you know, fraud prevention is, is always going to be top of mind, but how do we stop moving the goalposts and take some of the uncertainty out of some of these programs. Any thoughts on that as, as lenders specifically? Jason, I wonder if you could put on your promontory hat with the bigger promontory working with so many banks around the country in terms of how they're thinking about liquidity or what you're seeing from the banks. Yeah, so I, uh... I think from a liquidity perspective, the Fed did open a facility. Uh, it, it took a it took a little while, and it was not uh, it, it was not available immediately. But the Fed did open a facility to fund these loans without uh, without a haircut, uh, and that's something that you know could certainly be put in place at the start of the program rather than uh, rather than as a running start. I think there there might not have been a full appreciation uh, when the program was launched. The, uh, of the point someone mentioned earlier that this would create a liquidity, that the pricing would create a liquidity constraint on the bank uh, rather, than a liqui uh, rather than a liquidity need from the government. Uh, and it, uh, that, that was resolved. There, there are a few folks out there who are creating their own liquidity and servicing facilities for PPP. Uh, and that's an option that banks will have as well in this, uh, in this structure. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think that those two solutions go a long way toward uh, toward helping to resolve the the issue. Uh, I'll mention just as an aside, the liquidity of situ uh, the liquidity position of banks has changed quite a bit since the initial PPP. Uh, in March, banks were incredibly liquidity constrained. Uh, presently, though, you know, bank liquidity is at levels that you know are are close to half century highs. Uh, you know, uh, relative to their balance sheet. So there's much more flexibility within the banking system uh, to execute on a program like this, which at the same time is likely to be a smaller program than, uh, that, than the prior PPP rounds. Leave me any, any other? Yeah, I, I, um, I think we should, uh, for the next program, we should, banks should be required obligated to, I know the desire is to get the money out quickly, but that led to waste fraud and banks really weren't asked to underwrite uh, those loans. So those loans are for the most part, as someone else pointed out, were fairly easy to get, which means 
we just, as a banking community, we didn't have to do much work. It was more processing and it was very, very little credit work was involved. We didn't pull credit scores. We didn't do any of that. Uh, I think putting more banking into the next program uh, it would not be a bad thing. I think somebody, I think Jason mentioned, uh, making sure that the, this program is, uh, has the integrity because there are gonna be more crises and uh, we will be asked as a community to come in and support uh, and, and be the distribution for that capital. Um, so supporting the integrity of the program is, is very important. The, the uh, public opinion of the, of the program is very important to us. So I think putting more rather than less work into originating and, and uh, processing those loans, uh, and we know how to do it. I mean, that's, that's what banks do. I mean, we lend money. We know how to do those things. Uh, ask us to do it. Tell us to do it. And there are examples of good federal loan programs others have mentioned that, uh, that work well. Uh, one thing that I don't think was mentioned, I see it in one of the comments, the, one of the important aspects of the CARE Act, other than the money to borrowers, uh, has been the debt relief to both PPP borrower and other SBA borrowers that helped tremendously by removing the debt service, either by postponing it or forgiving it completely for 7A borrowers. Uh, that was a very important component, both for the, for the borrowers and for the banks, and uh, should definitely be part of uh, the next program, whatever that is. I want to just That's actually great. Oh, go ahead, Eric. Sorry. I, I, I just ahead. want to keep bringing us back to the fact that the banks cannot be the only uh, the only uh, delivery um, channel vehicle. For, for the vehicle channel. Thank you. Uh, it's it's got to include CDFIs and, and even CDFIs are they're not they're not enough of them. Any well, yep. there are a lot of them. They're, they're, they don't have enough capacity to do. I mean, we were one of the ones that had some scale, but we've got to think creatively about another way to get this relief to pe to people other than banks or require the banks to make these loans to people who are not their customers. Eric, is there any idea? You know, Eric and I have been on the more Eric than me have been on the front front of battling against the merchant cash advance industry and the, on the short-term online lenders for what I, in my opinion, are their usurious and awful habits. But the other side of those guys have learned how to get money to people to 24 and 48 hours by reviewing bank statements and looking at cash flow. Yeah. And there's a lot of technology there. And I know Eric at Opportunity Fund, you guys have done some work to try to come up with a more affordable product similar to that. Mm -hmm. Is that are there some lessons we can learn there that could either be applied to PPP or EIDL or something as a way of, without having to deal with tax returns, as a way of demonstrating lost revenue and, and turning money? And there's technology, there are technology platforms out there that do that. That's a, that's a really interesting thought on I me. Mean, I mean, the, uh, yeah, these folks can uh, turn around, you know, and get money in your hands and often 24 hours. They, they, we can also charge you 200% well, for it, yeah, but we don't know, want to do that. that. We know that. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, I don't know that some of those companies I wouldn't want to work with even <laughs> under any circumstances. But, I mean, it's, you know, American Express just bought uh, Cabbage, you know, like they could probably whip Cabbage into, you know, and Cabbage did a lot of PPP loans. I don't know, you know, I, I haven't seen any data on what, what that all looked like, but. It's a very interesting idea looking at uh, bank statements and credit card receivables to see how people's cash flows have been affected and be able to make a pretty quick uh, turnaround on providing them with a relief loan. And it's true that those, those companies serve a lot more people of color than banks do for better, I mean, for worse, mostly, but um, interesting. Well, uh -huh. I would also throw out that like PayPal was actually used. Now they're not a predatory lender uh, in the virtual cash advance world. However, you know, they have their issues as well <laughs> uh, to Eric's point, but they actually they're predatory, made the but they oppose any effort to rein in the predatory people. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, 
but they actually provided the most loans to communities of color and underserved communities. And one, it's because most small business owners uh, use PayPal and their products um, in order to service their business needs in the first place. And so they felt familiar, they felt comfortable. Uh, it seemed like it made sense, uh, although there are a lot of issues again. But to your point, there are opportunities where we can learn from these online lenders uh, because they do have those tools, those resources. It's just making sure there's regulation, I think as well, that is implemented prior to um, actually using them for, for the federal relief as well. I tried, to, I, mean, I tried to get some of them to be on this panel, but they don't really like to talk to me. So. Uh, I, I, I mean, I just a quick warning, and uh, maybe somebody in the crowd can fact check me. But the last report I've seen, I think three weeks ago, an American banker, the data indicates that a lot of those platforms, most of the fraud came through those. So while it's a quick way to get money out. It's, I, I don't know what the percentage is. I, again, I don't have the article on top of my, my fingerprints, fingertips, but I, I, I'm not sure that putting less uh, to automating the process or making it easier is the right thing to do. But they, maybe, Nimi, there's technology that instead of them doing it, there's there are lessons that can be used from the technology that they've built and used and brought into banks. I don't know. I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, I think you're asking a philosophical question about the intelligence that goes into FinTech and its ability to, it's not processing, it's, it's figuring out who to get it to. Processing, absolutely, but the banks have te similar technology as well. It is the AI that goes into determining whether it's a, the loan should be made in the first place. So it's a good question. I don't have the answer, but I'm not sure that looking for the PayPal's, the cabbages is necessarily the right way to get the money out. Yeah, Ami, I, I would toss out one other option, uh, which is that th there might be an opportunity here for a so-called public option uh, where the government could do a lot of this processing. Uh, bear in mind, every business that has employees files payroll, uh, uh, a payroll return with the IRS. Uh, you don't have to wait for the year end return uh, in order to know how much the business is paying its workers. Uh, and, you know, the IRS could use the data it already has in house uh, to send or to advance funds to, you know, to a business that requested it, uh, and then could track how that data, uh, how, that, uh, how that was used versus the payroll filings that the business then sends in. And, uh, you know, and it could collect the difference through taxes at the end of next year, as an example. So I think there is a, it, it, while, while it may not be the only channel uh, to use, particularly for folks that had difficulty accessing the bank channel uh, or accessing this funding in the first place, uh, it might be good to have a backup uh, where, where there's some certainty that someone that pays their taxes, meets their obligations, has a need for this funding, can in fact obtain this funding in a reasonably low friction way. Uh, the government already did this with the stimulus checks for individuals. Uh, you know, the twelve hundred dollar uh, payments. Uh, it's it's something that you know could plausibly happen for businesses as well. Hey Jason, real quick, I just want to jump in and say real quick. Um, so anything I think, including the IRS, at this point is probably not a good idea. Uh, like everybody else, they've suffered with um, their changes related to the pandemic, and they're actually very far behind on the workload. Um, and the stuff you saw with the stimulus was based on filed returns that already happened for 2019 or prior to that. And that's when they were working in their normal course of business up to that point. And then since April, they've been scattered also. And because of their lack of technology, they actually have a hard time getting back to people um, on, and on appropriate channels like email, like you would expect all of us do nowadays. Um, so even though I think it's a great idea, you're right. That's where the information lies. I think that there could be significant delays if you include them, unless they put some funding into giving them more uh, staffing. I, look, I, I think you would undoubtedly need staffing. You'd undoubtedly need funding. Uh, but I, I think the reality is that a lot of businesses had a lot of trouble accessing this financing uh, through any of the private sector channels. And there really are, it, the lack of connectivity to the banking sector should not be a reason that a business, you know, a business, uh, a minority-owned business, uh, other other businesses 
uh, can't get access to this type of funding when, when others can. So that, oh, go ahead, Steve. You're on mute, but go ahead. Yeah, I would like to disagree with connectivity to the banking industry. Every business has a checking account. Every business has a bank. The connectivity issue was in the institutional banks didn't participate. They didn't step up. Um, what people didn't have was a personal banker. That's the lack of connectivity. Um, and that's mostly from a community bank. And the small businesses, which disproportionately affected minorities, which is what Renee is talk, was talking about, and I'm interpreting what she said. Um, if you're banking with a big institutional bank and you don't have a personal relationship, then you were blocked. So the question is, how do we get the big institutional banks to participate um, with um, companies that are a million in sales and less and give them priority and solve that problem? Every one of them has a checking account. You make those banks participate. If, and, and regulators have a have a powerful way to do that. It goes back so to I just think that 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 would be efficient in a way to do it. I'm not a fan of, of government stepping in and doing things, but that's just my personal style. And if, and if government can do it, great. But make the banks do it. It goes back to incentives. I mean, the banks made a whole lot more money making PPP loans to the big businesses, and there was no reason at all to lend to the small businesses. They've, they've got to be adequately compensated or forced, one of the two. You hey guys, we're, um, we're about um, an hour. We have about 50 minutes left. And I want to make sure that we also, we talk about the other side of the coin. And I 100% get it and empathize. And we work every day with businesses that are need help and they need relief. And they are on literally hour by hour life support. And I feel awful for them. On the other hand of it, this is our work at, at multifunding. We've been also been working with clients who, who are really entrepreneurial and they want to see this as a time to grow and to expand and they want to invest and they want to double down and they want to tri triple down and they're willing to take risks to do that. And it's getting those clients Main Street Lending Program loans as one example. Um, I think I have several hundred more gray hairs on my head now than I did six months ago when the program started. We're actually planning a bonfire for all the FAQs wow. in the landing program. But, and I know a couple of us in this call have been participating in it. But for those businesses and those entrepreneurs, and maybe Jason, you can talk a little bit about what you guys did in the treasury uh, as part of the great recession. But what can we do uh, to help get the liquidity and the tools because sadly some of the jobs might never come back to restaurants and those people need jobs elsewhere and those entrepreneurs need resources also so i want to make sure that and i don't know if this is exactly the right time john and i don't want to twist the conversation but i want to make sure we spend some time on that side of the coin also and that's just that's not only big business it's uh renee eric others you know helping someone start a small business or they want to, they can't find a job and they need $10,000 to get a business going or a grant or across all the spectrum, or they want to start a delivery or they want to buy a FedEx delivery truck or whatever it might be. How do we also encourage growth? Yeah. So, so I mean, I just had one quick question I wanted to get in and then that was the, that was where right. we were headed. So Sorry, John, I've dropped um, the, no, it's totally, it, and it's the right question. And, and I'm one of the main street lending applicants and have lots to say, but I'm moderating, so I won't say much, but <laughs> one thing, one thing before we get there. So the, so the SBA by their, by their very um, nature was really drawn in early on in, in kind of, you know, March, April, May, because they had some of the vehicles in place to, you know, to, to be a, a technical resource in this. And it kind of got them off of their primary mission a little bit. I'd be interested to hear very quickly from, from a few of you, what role do you see for the SBA? What are some creative ways that the SBA can be maybe a more integral part of, again, Ami, to your point, growth capital, but also, um, you know, distress capital as well. And, in specifically in minority owned businesses, but what, what, 
what would be your recommendations if you could, you know, if you could talk to directly to the SBA about how they might look at their role in the, in the, you know, next six to 12 months? One thing that I would definitely say is there is an SBA office in a lot of cities um, throughout the country. They definitely need to have the information um, in a timely fashion because not all SBA offices are created equal, just like not all CDFIs are created equal, um, but they need to be put on equal playing fields um, in an understanding of exactly what the PPP is, EIDL is, more specifically, all of the rulemaking, the processes, so that they're able to help provide that assistance. And they should outwardly uh, try to host events. I know we're all virtual, so it's a little bit easier to be honest. Um, connecting with grassroots organizations, companies, uh, and small businesses in their, in their community that will be able to host these events where they can outwardly have these conversations and dialogues on the onset. I think when we wait and we execute and then think of the technical assistance and reaching out to those communities, that's where we fail. We need to do that and make that as the priority as part of the project plan, not some sort of like reaction to the lack of people who were part of this. Very good. Any other thoughts on? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the SBA, the SBA has to be allowed to take more risk in certain circumstances. Um, you know, if you look at who the SBA lends to in normal times, it's white men. That's who the SBA lends to in vast majority. Very, very little money is going to people of color and not a whole lot to women. But, um, and there are multiple reasons for that. But one of them is that from a pure sort of main, like old fashioned credit standpoint, um, businesses owned by people of color do look more risky. People don't have as much money. They don't own homes. They may have uh, issues with their credit history that have to do with things like medical bills. I mean, when you're very low income, you sometimes do have problems paying your bills. It's not because you're a bad character. It's just because of your life experience. And I think the SBA, you know, has to, Find, find a way. We have. To, if you think about it, we're going along on the SBA is doing what it does, having its you know very small percentage of loss on its guarantees. This big pandemic hits. All of a sudden, the SBA is giving out free money, and it all goes to who? White men. Um, so why can't the SBA in normal times take more risk for disadvantaged groups? And it can include low-income white men. Absolutely, they should also have access to uh, loans that are made at higher risk. But that's probably the biggest thing the SBA could do. The other thing I think is to seriously consider the SBA microloan program, in my opinion, is a really, really poor program. And all of that money should be turned into a big guarantee pool for CDFIs to do microloans. Okay, very good. So now, Ami, on to your, your, uh, your requests and the, the different subjects. So Forbes.com today, uh, about, I think, five hours or so, ran an article um, four things you, you should know about Main Street lending. And number three on their list was uh, Main Street lending won't be missed because unlike PPP, it's not forgivable. Therefore, the participation has been sparse. Um, I know that will elicit some very uh, stark responses from this group. So maybe reflect on that comment that Main Street lending hasn't been popular. To date, as of November 6th, about 420 Main Street loans for a total of about 4 billion out of 600 billion in committed capital uh, have been have been loaned. So I want to reflect on that to start and then uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Maybe I'll chime in and then I'd love to hear what Steve and Nimi have to say as well. I know they've been involved in the program. Um, the, the main sheet lending program, they, they started from scratch and they reinvented an entire program. Uh, and I, in some ways they had to do that with the PPP, but I don't think they had to reinvent an entire program with Main Street. I think they could have taken SBA as an example and the average Main Street loan is, is $10 million and increase the minimums of SBAs from 5 million to 10 million, maybe increase the guarantees, giving banks more incentives and the ability to sell the paper on the market, made it 10 year money and really got a whole lot of money out. I think of Bogwash that there's not a level of interest in the program. The program is so darn complicated and uh, so, and with such little incentive for the banks 
to participate or make any money on it. Um, I think it was uh, developed uh, really in a very bureaucratic uh, vacuum without really trying to figure out how to bring it into the street and, and think about scaling it. I'd love to hear what Nimi and Steve have to say. Uh, uh, Ami, you and I talked about the, it, it was just, it was just ill-conceived. It's uh, the, we're, we're gonna end up doing two, three, four, five of them, depending on uh, whether they extend the deadline, it doesn't appear that they are. The type of deals we've seen come through was equity risk. We're asked to take a lot of risk with those, either because the companies weren't cash flowing or because the prospects were unclear or because people were just asking for working capital, growth capital, they called it. They wanted to hire a bunch of people. So, so unsecured, uh, completely zero collateral. So that's, it's a fine wish, but it's equity risk. The way the program was structured is it just, it just wasn't structured for that, for that kind of quick amortization, the balloon payment, the low interest rate, the essentially no fees, just, there was just a mismatch between the sources and uses. So there wasn't a lot of demand and certainly there is not a lot of supply for that deal. I wouldn't I would try to reinvent it. I would just throw it away and start over. And as you pointed out, the SBA 7A, just just like they, they scaled it up from half a million to a million to two to five and, and uh, grew the program dramatically with and improved the credit outcome of that program, they can just up it to 10 and $20 million on the 7A and, and accomplish more than they would with a new um, Main Street, in my opinion. Steve? Yeah, we, we've done about a dozen loans and I'm gonna say, well, I hadn't added up all the numbers, but probably pushing 60, 70 million. And for a bank our size, that's a big number. We could get to 100 million if a, if a big one hits. Um, we found it to be a very successful program. Uh, what made it, uns and I got a phone call from the CEOs or chief credit officers of every independent bank in town wondering how we're doing it. Um, and I think the problem for, for this program, one of the problems, there's many problems as has been said, is that chief, uh, bank credit officers can't figure out how to underwrite it. Um, what do you do with a loan that in effect has 70% of the loan uh, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, not being paid back at the end of five years? It's in effect a, a longer term amortization. Um, what do you do with a loan but the, by definition in the current year, the company may, is probably losing money or very well could be losing money. So it, it's, it's, it's a challenge to figure out how to underwrite it. I think that was the biggest problem in, in having it uh, being uh, appreciated by banks. Um, we're getting inundated with loan requests right now as the program's running out and we're, being, and we're, not, we're not able to service them because there's not enough time. Uh, I think if there was more time in this program that it would be uh, accepted more and bankers would figure out that it isn't uh, death to have have it come due, uh, a, a balance come due at the end of five years like that. And, and there's ways to handle that, uh, the underwriting. Um, I think it could be more successful if it had more time. But um, the other piece is the certifications. Bus business owners don't like to certify to a five page list of certifications and they live on a year after the loan is paid off. So uh, the certification piece uh, desperate businesses will will sign that certification, but if a business is somewhat successful or can you know limp its way through this crisis, they're not going to sign up for that. So the certifications are you know too much, and just bankers not understanding how to underwrite it were the biggest two biggest faults um, on the program, in my opinion. As far as I, I think the idea that we've heard about um, just you know expanding the regular SBA program to be able to manage loans under 10 million. I think that's a sound idea. I'm not a real fan of my state and pretty much anything business um, uh, coming out of our government, but the California Guarantee Program 
is a far superior program, in my opinion, to SBA. And California has a state guarantee program that is just superb. And if the other um, it, it, the government could copy that um, program uh, during this pandemic time, quite frankly, copy it forever, um, it would be the SBA would be much better served. Yeah. yeah. Jason, can you maybe take, take a little bit about what happened in and I don't exactly remember when you went into Treasury, but how the Obama administration and what policies you put in place, um, SBA and Treasury and the Small Business Fund, and if you think there are any lessons learned there about what worked and didn't work that could be applied going forward. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think there are a number. Uh, while, while the situation is, is different, there, there are some policies that will have applicability across them. Uh, one thing uh, that the first was uh, the, the Obama administration increased the SBA guarantee levels uh, up to 95% in, in certain instances, and also increased uh, a little bit down the road, the SBA lending limit, uh, the cap from the 2 million to 5 million level. And that resulted, those two changes resulted in an enormous boost in SBA lending. I think it was close to double in, in what was a, a very contractionary year, uh, 2009. So I, th I think both of those uh, both of those alternatives uh, would be useful. Uh, I know Karen Mills, who was the administrator of the SBA, recently published uh, a piece in American Banker uh, walking through the mechanics of that. Uh, the second uh, second initiative uh, we pursued was uh, was the Small Business Lending Fund, uh, which was a program in which we partnered with uh, community regional banks as well as a broad number of community development loan funds to increase small business lending. And what we, what we did in that program was we provided capital to the bank uh, where the price they paid for that capital was tied to the amount of their increase in small business loans. So the more they, the more they increased their lending, uh, the lower the rate they paid uh, on the capital. And that then provided them with both the capacity with the additional capital to expand their balance sheet, as well as an incentive to go uh, increase lending to small businesses. And that proved to be, uh, that proved to be a, a, a successful program uh, we increased lending by about 19 billion over the program, so that's roughly equivalent to uh, you know to what the SBA does in a year as well, uh, and you know, it, it mostly in smaller dollar loans. The average loan in that uh, was was under $250,000, uh, and it's a program that because of the way it was designed uh, was was done uh, ultimately at no cost to the taxpayer. We'll earn a slight profit for the taxpayer. Uh, the third the third element or the third program here. Uh, which was a one and a half program to allocate to individuals to run small business support programs. So as an example, in California, things like that guarantee, uh, that state level loan guarantee program. Uh, in Michigan, uh, a collateral support program. In Virginia, a capital access program, where each state, with understanding their local economy and local needs, uh, could design and implement programs that were specific to, uh, you know, specific to the nature of the businesses in their, you know, in their region, in their state. Uh, and that program, I think, ultimately generated eight or nine billion of incremental lending as well. So those are, you know, th three, three examples of things that, uh, uh, that were pretty helpful. The, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say within that, uh, you know, just one area to call out was the support for uh, community development financial institutions. Which generally have, you know, generally have been under-resourced institutions uh, over the past, you know, 10 or 20 years. Uh, and in that, the uh, we had put forward the Community Development Capital Initiative, uh, which provided about half a billion dollars to CDFI banks and credit unions uh, to support their activities. Uh, Ooh. Ouch. Jason Frost. Okay. Yeah, Ami, could I step in real quickly if sure. he doesn't come back? Please. And then also through the Small Business Loan Fund, we did a uh, non. I think we're losing Jason. No, uh, so uh, just a couple of examples of uh, you know of what happened last time around. Obviously, you have ways to tweak all of these programs and and uh, you know increase their applicability to the situation we find ourselves in today. Um, yeah, but I think good templates to to consider for you know for what might happen going forward. Thank you, Jason. Andrew? Thanks. I just want to jump in because obviously I'm involved in this panel with most people are on the financing side, clearly, it sounds like at least. So I just want to bring it back down to the level where I see it because none of the financing happens unless 
the records that come from the business look a certain way. And you and Ami know, we have worked together for many, many years. I help business owners obtain SBA lending. And the first step that I do is make sure that the books are going to look good before they even make it to anywhere, because there's a whole lot of issues associated with information making to a bank that doesn't look appropriate. And I can shortcut for that business owner pretty early on, you will or will not get financing based upon what your books look like. So we're basically involved very heavily in making sure it looks a certain way. And I think that um, the MSLP, uh, we have not been successful in getting anybody yet uh, funded. Uh, we have one that's in the middle of it and they've been involved in it for now four months which normally when something's involved in a four month process, I start to think that's never gonna happen. Um, the reality is it might still happen, um, but it's obviously an expansion program. So for me, if a client came to me and said, hey, I wanna go for an MSLP, my first question would be, what's your projections? What are you using this money for? Do you, are you aware of the repayment terms? And to me, I wanna walk through all those steps with the person before they even go for the MSLP because it's gonna be asked for anyway, projections are generally asked for. And I think that for some reason, I expected the MSLP to be a lot easier than what it ended up turning out to be. It seems like another incarnation of the SBA process or worse that I've already set my clients up for. And for some reason, this is just, um, maybe it's everybody's just too busy. Um, it's very stalled very, very terribly. I don't know why. Yeah, I've had similar experience with Ami and I as well. I'm sure Ami has more to say. Ami, any final thoughts on that? I just think it's, they, they reinvented, they tried to build something from scratch and they tried to build a whole new thing and they did it and they got some comments and they took a lot of time. And then the banks had to figure it all out. And so they tried to reinvent um, kind of in a vacuum, a new program, and they didn't give banks a lot of financial incentives to do it, and it created a lot of confusion and a lot of legal bills. It's not, and this is not a program. It, I mean, the fact that they lowered the minimum to $100,000, it's like 25 or 50 grand of legal bills to get one of these things. And so I do think we need to support the middle market, and maybe there remains a continued place for Main Street for maybe loans of $10 million and above. But if the average loan is $10 million and we main real main street needs support and the SBA, despite all its imperfections has the infrastructure and has a community of tens of thousands of people around the country who do it for a living, who are, who are in place and ready to help. It seems like we reinvented everything and I get it. PPP was brand new. Yes. The SBA administered it, but PPP was a brand new program. Main street lending program was a, brand new program and maybe now eight or nine months in where some of that immediate crisis is over we can use some of the existing mechanisms in place well one thing i want to add is um the original legislation when the ppp was being crafted did not include 500 and above small businesses that was something that the senate added and that is where i honestly wholeheartedly believe the confusion started uh, when you think of small business, you're not thinking of 500 and more employees. And so when we start saying that this is considered small business, we then confuse not only our micro small business owners, but we're also confusing corporations who are now believing that they have the accessibility to get something that they technically do not deserve at this time or need. I think Renee is exactly right. I think this program was designed for bigger companies that got squeezed out of PPP. It has it's the, the language assumes uh, public stocks, publicly traded companies, it assumes big companies, and then they didn't get participation, and then they started trying to redesign it while they were playing the game, change the rules in the middle of the game and squeeze it down for smaller companies. Um, we just got one approved in two days. It about blew me away. I couldn't believe it. Um, the approval process has been taking a month and it bouncing back and forth over the most ridiculous reasons between the Fed and the bank. Uh, it is it is a, a brain damage uh, program. It's it's very difficult to get through uh, to funding. But the one that just happened, it funded yesterday in two days. I, I was shocked. We didn't even have their accounts open. Um, I just want to just briefly. There's a comment from someone from the audience saying, um, uh, "What support for companies that have been decimated by coronavirus?" And all I can say to the audience is. That's what we're here trying to do to help. We're trying to here to help 
participate and bring a voice to the conversation uh, for those of us on the front line. And hopefully it, it will bubble up to Congress and the legislatures and hopefully make a difference. So, yeah. And I mean, that was John said in his comment, he came in late. So, John, we did spend the first hour plus on on that topic and and then pivoted over to growth capital. So we we did. And the recording will be available. I think we could probably get that. Absolutely. It'll be shared with everybody. So. Yeah, so I, I think, Megan, what we might do at this point, um, Megan's been taking notes and and has kind of captured our um, ideas and recommendations. Maybe we can put those up on the screen and, and you know, take the last little bit and kind of reflect on and more importantly, edit and make sure that she's captured those uh, to accurately reflect, you know, the ideas of the panelists and then uh, and then we can do some final thoughts from there. So Megan, if you wanna pop that up on the screen. Sure, so I did take some notes here. I did wanna ask just because there was a lot said in that and for people who are just looking for, you know, a shorter summary of what we talked about here. Is there one thing from each person that, you know, if it could get bubbled up to Congress or to leaders who are creating this plan, what is that one thing that you would say? So a, a, a good question. Eric, you want to start with that? If you had one, if you had an elevator ride with Mitch or Nancy or whoever you pick, I think I know who you'd pick, but if you had an elevator ride with them and you had one thing to say as a basis of this call, what, what would that be? Uh, oh, it would be to, um, you know, put in place measures that ensure that a sizable chunk of relief money, whether it's debt, grant, whatever, uh, goes to smaller businesses and businesses owned by people of color. And do, you have any do, and do you have any specific recommendations about how that might happen? I set aside, uh, I set aside money for CDFIs and minority controlled uh, depository institutions. I would set aside money for smaller businesses. I would, uh, I would, you know, it, you know, make make it profitable to to provide the funding to smaller businesses and even smaller amounts. Steve Sefton, how about you? Target, and I think Eric is is, you know, on that. Make it targeted. Make it businesses under a million in sales give them preference. Uh, companies that have demonstrated a loss in revenue, um, you could target, uh, give minority owned businesses prefer preference. Force, um, force every bank that has a business with a checking account to participate and once, once they have their package, approve it in five days. Um, force the big banks to participate because I'm, I prefer to get the money out through the private industry and that would, and somehow forcing the big banks to participate would do it. Renee, how about you? I agree with everything that's being said, but I would also want to make sure that we exactly separate the tiers of businesses and really, 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 really have targeted technical assistance funding to ensure the smaller, low income communities of color who are really impacted by coronavirus and closures of their business are able to sustain themselves and that they're able to use the money uh, that they receive from the loan uh, for whether it's getting PPE for their employees, for their own salary, whatever they need to do to sustain their business. Andrew. Um, targeting for sure. I mean, we already said that uh, several times. So I'm not going to skip. I'm just going to say it because I agree with it entirely. I think um, uh, I was thinking about one, trying to get one thing. I don't think I can. So I um, think the application process has to be a lot simpler um, for the targeted people to be want to participate in it because of their how busy their schedules are. And I think you have to think about whether you're gonna have blanket forgiveness for certain loans, uh, uh, loans under a certain amount. 
irregardless of whether or not there's verification or not. Uh, because I think that to get to that target, you're gonna have to make it as easy as possible for them to have less time spent on getting through this process and less time having to prove that they use the money for the right purposes. And I get that that brings up some fraudulent issues, but we had fraud even with the original process. So um, I think that um, application easier, blanket forgiveness for these people, make it easy for them to get the money and have not spent a lot of time. Jason. Apologies. Uh, I, I mentioned two things. One is I, I think it's I think one of the things we learned the last time around is if when you work with institutions uh, that that focus on smaller businesses and focus on uh, specific communities, you tend to be able to serve those businesses and communities a little bit more effectively. Uh, so community banks, uh, state level programs, uh, CDFIs, uh, community development financial institutions, community development loan funds, all very successful at getting capital to the truly smaller businesses, micro businesses. The other thing that I, I think is worth mentioning and we haven't discussed it is, you know, there are a lot of businesses that simply are not going to make it, have not made it through this period. Uh, there, there was a, a study Yelp, uh, Yelp came out with a couple of months ago now saying that of the businesses that they had marked closed due to COVID, 60% uh, of them are now permanently closed. And I, I think that that is a real loss for our economy. Small businesses are a huge part of the dynamism and they're very difficult to build from the ground up. Uh, and I think it's worth considering policies to help business owners uh, that struggled through this period rebuild their businesses uh, in, in, addition to, uh, in addition to supporting those businesses that, you know, that, that continue to operate, uh, but simply need some help to get through the next few months. Me, how about you? Yeah, I think the the list, I'm reading the list, it's a great list. So I would just say, get off your asses. Uh, we've been waiting, we've been ready for months now to get more money to um, to bars, existing and new. Just, it's, it's really hard watching what's going on because we are ready to do it. Nima, you gave Megan a challenge say, to edit your comments there. <laughs> I see that. John, do you and I get to add our two cents? I think we do. You first. Um, yeah, I, and I would not have edited. I mean, I agree. Get off your asses. But, uh, I wouldn't have, but I figured I'd be politically correct. Oh, you're so nice, Megan. <laughs> no, for, for me, I, again, and I come at it maybe with a, a bit of a bias, but we work with growth companies um and by large a lot of our scaling growth the only constraint right now for them is access to capital and, and i'm one of them i mean i see a path to create you know we're in a philadelphia suburb i see a path to create you know probably 50 to 100 jobs in the next 12 to 24 months and the single constraint for me is access to capital and main street had a lot of promise i, I i'm totally comfortable with the terms and the and the balloon and all of it. And it's just been a, a really difficult thing to get done. And, and I, I think as, and again, I'm, like I said, I've invested in a restaurant. Our restaurant is, is probably likely to close um, in the spring, I would imagine. And, but those people are going to need other jobs and those jobs need to be created. And, and I am all for supporting businesses that are really in trouble. Um, and I think that's critically important, but I also think we can't lose sight of the growth side of the equation. And to Nimi's point, it, it's just, you know, and it's, it's been sad all over today, but it's too difficult. It's too onerous. There's, there's too many hoops to jump through. We have to stop moving the goalposts. We have to give people the ability to, to see um, the rules and, and make decisions from a point of clarity, not a point of confusion. And, and it's tragic that, you know, we've, we've locked up this liquidity for legitimate growth companies. And it's got, I think it's got to change. And it's, it's the path out. you look at what the stock market's done and you look at the commercial paper market, you know, public companies have all the liquidity they need and it's, it's been a boon for them. And, you know, startups get, get lots of a, attention and 
but the middle market always had, doesn't have the power to lobby, doesn't have the liquidity, always gets squeezed. And it's now is not the time for the middle market, which is the engine of job creation in the United States. It is not the time to squeeze the liquidity out of the middle market. I guess I did have something to say, Ami. So now, now, yeah. we love you. Here's my two cents. I like to see SBA minimums increased, maximums increased from $5 million to $10 million. I like to see government guarantees increase from 90 to 95%. I'd like to see fees gone for a while, borrower fees, and possibly at working capital amortizations increase from 10 to 15 years. With the idea that if that worked so well last time, maybe it could help again. On the relief side, I'd love to see some cooperation so we can figure out how to use those bank statements to quickly figure out who's been hit by losses. We haven't talked much about the EIDL program, but short, and with ups and downs, pros and cons, the government decided to cut EIDL to 150 grand, and they've got the money out in 24 to 48 hours. So maybe there's a mechanism through the EIDL where you can identify the businesses that have been hit the hardest and get more money out to them quickly. And I know that's not forgivable, but it is a mechanism to get the money out. Great. So Ami, I, I thought where we might close, um, we've got about, I think 15 minutes left or so, and, and I would love to do a quick grab. I, I think one of the issues is um, a lot of the news that we hear a lot of the financial news that we hear are about outliers The you know, the company that shouldn't have got this loan or that loan and this fraud and that fraud. And we're not doing enough around telling the amazing story that the, the people on this call and the people like the people on this call have created in the world. It's, it's been an onerous time to be a lender. It's been an onerous time to be a, a community supporter and, there are some amazing heroic stories that have happened. So if anyone's got a, a quick anecdote where, you know, you stepped in with a client or you, you created a credit facility or, or a positive story, Eric, I loved your story at the beginning. I, that was absolutely a great way to open. And I think that would also be a great way to close. So we want to do a quick round on that. And then I think um, any final thoughts that you have and we can, we can wrap it up. Eric, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I'll go now to one, I just, one of our very smallest clients, um, <clears throat> woman uh, who runs a flower shop in Menlo Park, who I, who I made a $500 loan to in the very early years of, of Opportunity Fund. And even then, that was like well below our minimum loan amount, which was like 5000 I think. He was a, a recent immigrant who was making little party favors for um, quinceaneras and um, you know weddings and stuff. And she paid us back. Didn't hear from her for I don't know, like ten years. And then I, I find out from another client ten years later that they were referred by her and that she now owns a flower shop in the Little Park. So she's gone from sort of making things for the weddings and baptisms to opening a brick and mortar store. And um, when this Pandem when this pandemic hit, uh, I tried to find her and it was really hard. Uh, we, uh, she had changed her cell phone number or something and I um, couldn't, couldn't get down there to Menlo Park at the time. And, um, but anyway, after several calls, I found her and you know, she hadn't heard about the PPP program. She was, you know, her store was, the note store was closed. She didn't have any revenue coming in, anything. And um, we got her through the through the program and got her what I believe was a $6,000 PPP loan, which was a huge help to her. And uh, she was able to you know, sort of reopen and pivot and do more deliveries and um, has, has so far made it through. So hats off to Thank her. You. Thank you. Andrew, you have one? Uh, God, I'm trying to think of one, uh, it's crazy. Um, I think my favorite is a um, client of mine um, <clears throat> has a preschool and summer day camp business. 
And normally in April and May is when they're ready to go for their summer business and all their cash flows in and they got to decide what's going to happen. And this is just when the pandemic is hitting. So imagine trying to figure out if your business is even going to open in the summer, let alone if it's going to open all the things you need to do to make it safe for everybody and try to obtain this PPP loan and try to figure out cash flow and so forth and so on. And um, they successfully opened and it was one of only two or three in my entire area that actually opened for the summer. Um, and um, they were only survived to this point because of the PPP loan um, and, uh, and the, the really happy customers that they had that made it easy for them on their cash flow. And even yesterday I spoke with them and he's concerned about what next year looks like and is this pandemic going to continue and is there another program coming? And the only reason he made it through and is still open today is because of the PPP loan. Um, and he knows it. And I applaud him for all of the steps he made to change his business model and all the expenditures he had to make to change his business model in a very, very, very short period of time. Um, it was really incredible. And I think that's the stories. I'm glad you're finishing this because I hear these stories and just makes me understand this, the um, entrepreneurial spirit and the will to run through walls. And um, there are so many of them out there. And uh, that one is probably my favorite. That's awesome. Thank you. Renee, do you want to share? Um, sadly, we don't have a lot of great stories that are coming in. Um, we are hearing a lot of sad things. So I don't want to bore anyone with sadness because we already talked about that. But just want to reiterate that, you know, there definitely needs to be some assistance to communities of color and to the very small businesses. Thank you. Jason? Well, one of the things that's been uh, it, it just really impressive to see is the is the sheer resilience uh, and and grit that the, the small business we, businesses we work with uh, have have demonstrated through this period. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. We're a lender to uh, an emergency medical transportation business. Uh, they, they essentially run a, a set of ambulance services in rural areas. Uh, as it happens, one uh, you know one of their uh, you know, one of the core reasons people call ambulances is when they get in a vehicle accident. Uh, when the shelter in place happened, there were very few vehicle accidents. And so there was, there was a great public health uh, silver lining in the middle of the catastrophe, but it was very difficult for their business because they, while their costs continued, their, uh, a, a large part of their revenue went away. Uh, you know, they were able to work with their townships. They were able to uh, you know, work with their employees to keep everyone on board, uh, to keep the business going. And ultimately, you know, ultimately we're able to recover into what today is an even stronger position. Uh, and it's uh, you know, to, to see someone go uh, have a big business, uh, a large part of their business go from, uh, you know, go from 100 down to zero and then come back again and build it back even stronger just speaks to the, the, the sort of true nature, character, resilience of entrepreneurs. And the real reason, uh, you know, it, I think it helps to evidence the importance of, uh, of entrepreneurship in our economy. And when you see these, when you see these activities on the ground, it, uh, it, it it's really striking. Uh, I'm not sure that other countries, other economies, uh, have the same number of folks who are, you know, who are out starting their own businesses, building them, uh, working through challenges, and and driving growth for their, uh, you know, for their national economy. That's great. Thank you for sharing that, Nimi. Yeah, it's going to sound like an advertisement, but for me, it's less the uh, it's an accumulation of about 3,000 anecdotes similar to what everybody was just saying. So uh, pretty uh, proud and excited about the impact we, the community banks, the small banks, the other lending institutions did in the last few months and uh, really looking forward to the next round. That's great, Steve. So we did 846 loans, and we think that only about 100 of those um, client non-clients will become clients and fit our client profile. So when you subtract out customers and the new clients that might come to the bank, we did well over 500 loans, uh, more than half, to people, businesses that will never become clients of the bank. And we did that because we wanted to support our, our local economy. And I can, I have so many business owners that were crying on the phone when we told them they got approved. I just, the stories are endless. 
Um, but one that really um, wears on me is, is the family that's a three generation family business for a wedding venue. And as you can imagine, they're completely shut down. And that business would have gone along with 50 jobs. It's a sizable, maybe one of the largest ones in San Diego County, a sizable wedding venue and three generations, 50 jobs. And the PPP loan and the Main Street loan that we're making them are the only things keeping them in business, keeping them alive today. And they would tell you that, um, you know, the, the program that we help them with is the only reason that, that their business is still surviving. And um, I just, I, we found these programs, both the Main Street and PPP, to be tremendous booms for um, a tremendous help for all of the companies we worked with. That's great. Thank you for sharing that, Ami. Yeah, I'm going to share uh, two. I'm going to I'm going to cheat and share two stories. Okay, Joe. <laughs> so one of really them. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to John and his scaling up organization. We partner with them. I'm a member of Entrepreneurs Organization, and we built a series. Entrepreneurs Organization is a group of about 14,000 entrepreneurs around the world, and together we built a series with called Reimagine Your Business, business where we helped uh, entrepreneurs figure out how to pivot. And with the coaches who volunteered their time, we got together with four groups of four entrepreneurs, and I think several hundred went through the program. And it was just amazing to see the energy and the camaraderie as entrepreneurs from different nations around the world uh, figured out and used the tools of the Scaling Up organization to do that. And it was, it was a lot of work, but it was really an energy boost. And the other side is... Um, this is a story that hasn't ended yet, but um, a group of us are working. There's a company in Philadelphia called Rosati Water Ice. There's actually a GoFundMe out. And I know there's a lot of sub stories, uh, tough stories out there called GoFundMe. They're a 109-year-old iconic Philadelphia brand that sells water ice in 70% of their schools or sales of school districts. And uh, he, it's a Vietnam, it's not a Vietnam vet, a veteran who's a West Point grad who owns this company whose business is, is petering on it's really rough and between the gofundme and tons of efforts to add new outlets and retail outlets for him the amount of support and the amount of support the sba lender has given him and giving him patience to ride through it has been incredible so watching how people are rallying together to help entrepreneurs and business owners is also really awesome that's great I, and that's that's a great I think that's a great place to land. Entrepreneurs are the first responders of our economy and they've been overlooked. And I think, you know, everyone on this call that supports an entrepreneur is a hero to me. So uh, Ami, thanks for putting it together to the panel. I think we've got a great action item list and, and a lot of go forward ideas. And it was an honor to, to be able to moderate today. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, and a sincere thanks to, to every single person on this call for what you do for entrepreneurs. It's, uh, you know, it's an unsung hero kind of role sometimes. And, and I, I don't think it gets the attention that it needs. And we have lots of negative stories and we need to tell more positive stories like we just did. So thank you all very much. Yeah. John, and thank you so much for moderating and for all the work you've done to help entrepreneurs through all this. And for the help work and help everyone on this panel has done. Just for the folks that uh, have been listening in, I hope you found it interesting. We will be uh, shortly after sharing a copy of the record recording as also uh, summarizing our findings and our ideas and recommendations and sharing that with anyone. I know there's a fair amount of uh, press who've been participating and listening. If you want to speak to um, any of the panelists individually and want their contact information, please feel free to reach out to my office and we'll be happy to share that with you. And this is a, uh, I, I joke about it, but I feel like uh, since uh, COVID started, we've been running a marathon and we just hit about the one mile marker. And this conversation will continue. And I think this form of the people on the front line of providing the economic relief has been helpful and hopefully we'll find more ways to continue this and continue this discussion. So. Thank you so much. You're, everyone's uh, donated their time to this today and appreciate it. And uh, God bless and Godspeed. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Um, thanks, guys. Thanks.